It's 935 K Day, the morning show. Romeo holding it down with the legendary, the man right here, Too Short in the building. Let me tell you something, man. We do a lot of shows with you, Too Short. Mm -hmm. And whenever you're on the line, we know what it is, though. I was just amazed at myself walking through the hallway here. I'm like, I'm on that poster. <laughs> I'm on that poster. I was, I was... It's necessary, though. I mean, when we do a show here in LA, you got to be on the lineup, man. Well, I do appreciate the way you guys always call me for the shows. Yeah. I also appreciate the fact that you never really ask for a long performance. Like just 20, 30 minutes is cool, and you guys pay like twice as much as everybody else. Love it. See? See? Two Love it. on back. I ne coming I never, in hot. <laughs> I never got to thank y'all, man. Thanks. Like, for real. And, and we do it a lot. Well, I don't understand why we have it so short with you, man, because, no pun intended, because really you should be doing like an hour show, man, with what you bring, for real. I, well, you know, I don't understand the logic of that, but there's a reason why. I don't know why. Okay. But I always get put in the lineup a little early, and they always say, just do it. We don't. We only want 20 minutes. I'm like, 20 minutes. But I do have a technique, though. Yeah. When I do those kind of shows, if you notice as a as a spectator in the audience, I do the songs really fast. Mm -hmm. I only do like one verse or like half, like 30 seconds of the song. I, I give you all the songs, but just barely. But but as someone that appreciates the record wants so much more sometimes, you know what I'm saying? This girl's and out there just- And you guys have a little clock that ticks backwards. <laughs> What up, AD? And then the DJ, <laughs> the DJ, I'm like, I look back at my DJ like, what are you doing? He's like, they cut me off. <laughs> wow. But it, it's it, cool, though. It's, it's all good, man. It's all good. Well, we're glad you still come. I'll, be at, city, I'll be at the next one, and I was at the last one. It's all good. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Puff Puff Pass going down in a few weeks, so I know you're going to represent there. Now, let's go back. First of all, you got a new album just dropping, right? And that's dropping, is it this weekend? Or? It's in a couple of days. Okay. Uh, and what's it called? It's called The Pimp Tape. Hmm. And it's literally a tape. Really? Well, you know, but it's, know. We, we are actually pressing up cassettes. You, uh, you got to, man. Why not? You know it's, what I mean? People want to know. It's not. It's not for. It's not for novelty. People really want cassettes, right? Am I right? No. I don't know who, but somebody does. <laughs> Trust me, they'll want it, man. But hey, that's how I start out the trunk, though. If you think the wax, about it, the wax and the cassettes are like things that you know, collector. I, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody's out there wanting that stuff. True. We that. got boom boxes that literally play cassettes. <laughs> Still got them. I got one. We got brand new ones. <laughs> No, for real. So let's talk about the new project. What was your approach on this one, on number 20? Um, well, the process was a lot different than anything I've ever done before. And this time around, I I utilized a lot of people around me, like a lot of team members chipped in to, mm -hmm. to motivate me during this album. I honestly stepped into this a couple years ago, not really wanting to do it. Not not because I didn't feel confident or anything. I just really didn't want to do it. I, right. Things were going good. You know, it wasn't really a financial thing. It was just uh, somebody brought to my attention that, you know, you got 19 albums. And I'm like, that's cool. It's like you can't end your career with a number 19. You got <laughs> you to gotta round it off. So my man, Mr. Fab, up in Oakland, he was like, uh, he like you got to do this, bro. You got to. And he, he, he badgered me for the longest. And finally, I just, you know, made some calls. I'm like, you know, I called my, my man Ghazi at Empire. Yeah. And he was like, if you do it, I'll back it. That's all I need to know. I didn't want to, like, make an album that had no love and just, you know, just playing around the studio. Oh, the OG put an album out. Oh, okay. And it just go away in yeah, two weeks. Just, yeah. It, it so, could be one, just one of those. I get it. A couple of good things took place. Um, I actually, the process of recording this album was uh, lengthy. Mm -hmm. And it just, I once I started, I couldn't really stop. So I got to about 30, 40 songs. And probably made about 30, 40 more. I don't know. I just we just never stopped. And the difference in this album and any other album, you, normally I'll just go in there and make make an album. Like right. literally, I used to, for years and years, I would just go in there and make an album. This is the album. But this time I, I let different people give me opinions and you know, I worked with all these different producers. I brought in a lot of guest appearances. I just, you know, I, I did It sounded like you were just having fun with this. Like, you know what, just going with going with the vibe. And then in the end, what happened was I'm sitting here as we speak right now with um, about 50 songs that didn't make the album, and they're good songs. So uh, the motivation is that um, when I look at it from my angle, I'm like, uh, what is the expiration date for a rapper? True, I mean, that's a good question. What is too old for a rapper? Who's going to be the first rapper that's successful in his 50s or 60s? Mm -hmm. Like somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to. It's bound to happen. I agree. I'm 52, but it's like a lot of dudes approaching that Five oh, the forty just hit fifty. I think you know a lot of rappers are over forty five. A lot of those um, 
P. Diddy's and yeah, I don't want to name all the, all the OG rappers, right, but you know right. who they are. Some of them can't handle that part, but it's all good. Yeah, they 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 working that die, <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep it uh not gray. But uh, I just think that uh for hip hop, just like the blues, just like jazz, just like rock and roll, somebody's got to just step out there and be the OG still doing it. So you know, if it's me, I'll I'll do it. I, I'm proud to do it. But the one thing that I am going to do is after this album, I'm going to yeah. release a lot of music. Okay. So that's my mission. So you do you think doing this last album, album number 20, has motivated you to say, you know what, I got a lot of stuff in the vault, so I'm just going to start releasing it. So when yeah. you, There's no plan for album 21, but I, right. there's probably going to be like 50 singles <laughs> after that. Damn. I just, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going to stop rapping. At some point in my mind, I, I wrestled back and forth with, you've done enough, it's a good, good legacy, you know? But then you, you just, it's hip-hop, man. You, like, if you make beats or if you DJ... Or if you yeah. rap, you just, it's hard to stop. Yeah, and if and if you're talking about some people want to hear it, you know, too short. And you've always your content's always been deep. You're always cut through whether it's a party record, whether you're talking about things you did in the hood. Mm -hmm. So let's take them back to the beginning because you were born in L.A., right? Mm -hmm. Sunset <laughs> Boulevard, Kaiser Hospital. So if you would have never moved to Oakland, would you still want to rap? You knew then, was it in you, or was there something in? I Oakland highly doubt you? if I didn't move to Oakland, if I ever would have been a rapper. It was something that just happened in my life. Like it just progressed to that. I moved to Oakland. In 1980, mm -hmm. the first time I ever heard rap was 1979. Okay. So one day I was just by myself and I was just listening to some rap records. I'm like, I can do that. Like I, I, I was always in the band in class. I used to be a drummer. I was in the marching band. I did all kind of little stuff that I just had that rhythm where I could make beats. I could, you know, pick up the cadence of what it is to rap. Right. So I tried it and it worked. I think I was in like 10th grade back then, and I just kept making little homemade tapes. Got uh, popular around Oakland, but I think that the reason why I say I, I don't think I would have ever rapped if I didn't move to Oakland is because mm -hmm. everything about my rap career was Oakland. Okay. The, the ins inspiration to even do the first rap was Oakland. The inspiration to what to rap about was Oakland. And I think that that moving up there, mm -hmm. the big the the way the Bay is different than L.A., I think I was just more like fascinated by, you know, it looked like a movie to me. Like, you know, I, I grew up watching those movies in the 70s. Yeah. The black exploitation movies. And when I got to Oakland, I'm like, damn, I'm right in the middle of the movie. Hmm. Like, it looked like it. It was real colorful and pimping and all this other stuff. And I just, I started rapping about Oakland. I think that sort of that, uh, I don't know, that outsider's view yeah. is what made me. And what was one of the first rap records you ever heard, Too Short? And then why is the message, why was that record? Why did it cut through to you? Well, the first rap record that I gravitated towards was Rapper's Delight. Okay. I had heard rap things before that. There were songs that had like little rap in it, some Parliament Funkadelic, some some fat back. It was songs that were coming out where you could hear what rap was, mm -hmm. but they weren't calling it that. But when Rapper's Delight came out, and I know Rapper's Delight is like a to the New Yorkers, that's not like it. Because uh, what the the truth about this the song that they stole all the words or something? Yeah. But that's what came to us on the West Coast commercially on the airwaves was Rapper's Delight. Okay. And I remember uh, I had two records. I had Funkadelic, Knee Deep, and I had Rapper's Delight. And both mm. of those records were, were literally like 15 minutes long. Mm -hmm. And I used to play them both back to back, back to back, back to back. And then um, after I just, the rap was just in me. The records started coming out, you know, the Curtis Blow, Grandmaster Flash yep. records, you know. And I was, rec records used to come out on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I was in that record store every Tuesday trying to see if a new rap record came out because I, I was just in love with it. So I am, um, not very long after I heard rap for the first time, I tried it. So I, I feel like, you know, I feel like a pioneer. <laughs> you are. I mean, you fell in love with hip hop. Uh, you were there in the beginning of it, so mm -hmm. to speak, and the way you just embraced it, you know what I'm saying? But it's crazy knowing that if you never moved to Oakland, there'd been a big gap. Probably in hip hop world right now, especially on the West Coast too, though. If you think, yeah. About it. Shout out to my father because he wasn't having it, man. I was gonna if I if I, if I did his program, I'd yeah. be Doctor Sh Doctor Short, <laughs> <laughs> delivering babies or, or curing cancer or something like that. Something like that, yeah. He just he just wanted me to uh, play golf and be a doctor, but it, but at the same time, you know, my parents were the kind of parents that were like, you you're not going to be a failure. So regardless of what I did, I had to overachieve and I had to you know have that follow through. So we're going from a dad that probably would want you to be a doctor. You're selling records out the trunk. You have mm -hmm. all this success. How do they feel about you and what you're doing in the rap game early on? 
Well, it, nowadays you get like a little kid who wants to rap, and he's like, "Mom, I need this and that." I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm rapping about my music and stuff. But back then, it was like I probably, I probably felt like if they knew, I'd mm-hmm. be in trouble. So okay, I was a secret rapper. It, it was, <laughs> And what I was rapping about in high school was similar to what I rap about now. So oh, okay. I was hiding it for a reason. And, you know, I, my mother did find a rap book once. She found this little book that had a bunch of rhymes in it. It was in my drawer. And she didn't talk to me about it. She didn't say anything. She put a note in the book, mm-hmm. a really long note. And it was a, the guilt, it guilt tripped me to death. But it, it didn't really work. Uh huh. But she just, she was pissed, man. She was really pissed about what she read in that book. And she was, you know, a little disappointed that. You know, but later on, when she got those Mercedes and those houses, she didn't complain. She's like, "Oh, I get it now, baby. I get it now." And then my father, he uh, he just said, uh, "You know, if y'all parents are, I man, he's just like, well, you know, the little music thing is cool, but you know, you got to get a real job. You got to go to school and all that stuff. Yeah. It, was, it was it was that type of thing. Got to have a backup plan." I had a couple of aunties that that uh were young, early on fans though. Mm-hmm. They were like, this, "This is good." So I have I had motivation from family members, and I had an older brother who was a. Uh, Continuously telling me you ain't shit. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. like, man, that, that sounds terrible. And then later on, he said, I was just trying to make you tough. But <laughs> you know, I knew it sounded good. I knew what it was. I knew I, I had a good music ear, and I knew what I was doing. And you know, everything just it just lined up the way it was supposed to. It sounded like it did, man. We're glad it did, as a matter of mm-hmm. fact. But 1981, I believe, is that when you made the trip to the Radio Shack? When did you make that trip? Yeah, that was probably. Um, Christmas of 81. Okay. And, and what did I, you pick up that day? I convinced my mother. I had my, Now, my father had given me a hand-me-down stereo. Okay. It's where you, like, could take a, the, the cassette player and unplug it and the record player, all different pieces. Mm-hmm. So I learned how to, I used to, just just for the hell of it, I used to take it apart and move it across the room, put it back together. I used to just move it all around because I knew how to take the speakers loose. It was a big deal to me. Right. So um, I convinced my mother that I could add pieces to this set i needed a mixer i needed a microphone and i needed a um the little voice effects machine yep got it at radio shack back then the mixer probably was 99 dollars. the effects machine was probably like 39 and the mic was probably like 19 so yep. it wasn't asking a lot mm-hmm. but she has no idea when she gave me that that changed everything so that was it it changed everything i had already knew how to record and set the levels so that you push it up in the red a little bit so that when you play it back it's not distorted but it's loud Mm-hmm. And I knew all these little nice little tricks that I learned from having my little stereo, and I incorporated it all. We, it was all trial and error. I had a rap partner back then named Freddie B. Yeah. And together, when, what I could do with a cassette tape and the way he knew the streets of Oakland, it just it just was a match made in heaven. So I used to do the, you know about the pause mix? Yeah. Yeah, cause I, I could take an instrumental mm-hmm. and make that thing last for 30 minutes. And you would never know where it stopped and Come started. On, you just on the radio, you know just what a loop and what it yeah. let off the pause button. Yeah, I was good at that. So that, that's how it came up. Okay. So you could sound like you could have been DJing and everything I else. I was a DJ. Oh, so see? I was the East Oakland uh, house party DJ. Wow. I used, to, I used to DJ the parties that most people were scared, were scared to DJ. And see, that's what's so dope that I'm taking them back because you have a lot of people that's with today's rap, but they're still connected to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we're talking about you being in the game. How many years now? And how does it feel to still be relevant? And people, the young, the youth, to know about you, though. How does that make you feel? It's an amazing feeling to perform a song like Freaky Tales or even a song like Getting It. Yeah. And you look at somebody, you're like, this little dude's singing the words, and he couldn't have been alive when I made this song. So it's a, it's a good feeling Yeah. To, to, to make music that's generational, you know? You know, and while we're talking about Oakland real quick, because I am a Raider fan, I don't want to stay on this part too long because it's kind of depressing. Uh, the city, how does the city feel knowing that they're going to be leaving? Like, have half the people throwing in the towel on them? Or are you still like, is there hope? We like, all have still... our own individual emotions. We, okay. we bring this subject up in a room and people are like, man, I'm not going to be a fan if they move. And that's all kind of things. But I'm one of those Raider Nation people. I think yeah. that's a thing. You in it, you in it, no matter what. Exactly. So I just was um, in Houston the other day. And we had some friends from Oakland that relocated, and it was a bunch of us from Oakland that were there. We had a little powwow, mm-hmm. and I look, I'm looking around. I'm like, it's, I'm like, did you guys notice we all are dressed like Raiders, but nobody has the logo on? Everybody's wearing silver and black, or <laughs> black and white, or some kind of Raider colors, but nobody's wearing the logo. So I feel like um, I made a song called Raider Colors. Okay. And I'm like, this ain't about football. This is this is about you cut me with a razor blade, my blood is silver. Hmm. So. We argue all the time. It's only 
two people that I want to hear from. Okay. Uh, Giants fan and Cowboys fans. You want to talk football and, and talk down on the Raiders, it's okay, but not a Cowboys fan or a Giants fan. I don't want to hear the New Yorkers or the Dallas people. Let it go. What about we we all Rams in the same fan. boat right now. DJ Demo's a Rams fan, so I got to hear his shit every week. So I know for a fact that he was not a Rams fan two years ago. Uh-oh. He was Truth not. Truth saying for a fact. Nobody in L.A. was. I was a Rams fan. I was little. He said he was a Rams How old are you? Me? I'm 37. You from St. Louis? You from the original Rams when they yeah. were in L.A.? Yes. You had to be like two. <laughs> I grew up on uncle. I, I grew up on the Rams, too, but when they went to St. Louis, we didn't really follow the Rams. Yeah. I still follow them. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm, I'm watching a bunch of Raider fans jump ship. Yeah. Jump on the bandwagon right now. And I'm, I'm seeing that, too. I was testing out the crowds when the Rams came out here. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, because well, the Ra- L.A. didn't like the Rams when they showed up. They act like it was it was a plague or something like it was like. Well, a lot of people are like, no, why are you bringing the Rams? We want the Raiders. Here. Exactly. Oh, now you're bringing the Chargers. Where are the Raiders at? Exactly. So I would on stage in my show. I'm like, where the Rams fans at? They're like, woo woo. I'm like, where the Raider fans at? Crowd go crazy. Yep. It's starting to change now. Uh-huh. People are jumping ship, and once the playoffs come this year, and it's all said and done, um, we're gonna take a we're gonna take another uh, tally and see. You know who who stayed yeah. Raider. See, see who stays true to him. And, and and I think I don't know what Gruden is doing, but I'm hoping he's just getting ready for the Vegas situation. Like he's trying to get all these draft picks. I think Gruden is still mad at us. <laughs> it appears to be that he's mad at us. Why? Well, why? Why do we bring that dude back? Something I'm happened just, in old three or something when we sent him to Tampa, and he's he ain't letting it go. No, he's not. But we bring him back. I don't understand that man. Who is Mark Davis's barber? <laughs> <laughs> good question. Somebody I, need to answer that right now. I think that's the problem with the Raiders right now. The owner can't get a good haircut. You're going to have all that money and you cutting your hair with a bowl. Let's put a bowl on his head and cut it around like that. That's the old hood cut right there. Hey, man, just draw a line right here. And Bro, they got pictures of him down. when he was like a little boy. It's yeah. the same haircut. <laughs> he been working that cut. He looked like Dumb and Dumber. Is he married? He need a woman who's like to tell him differently. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, man. But that's I, I'm I'm a, I'm a little upset with this guy. <laughs> Too short hanging out with the K Day Morning Show, but like you brought a lot to the world musically. But let's talk about the situation because obviously I think Cube's new album. I think are you featured on that? I'm on there. The only one from well, what I, I heard Cube that. said. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And this stems back to you approaching him back in the NWA days, mm-hmm. helping him get out of that situation. Yeah, that's, that's my boy. How did that even come about? Well, I met Cube before. Uh, Straight Outta Compton came out, mm-hmm. and when we went on that tour, I, I was on the Straight Outta Compton tour. Okay. When we went on that tour, I was really close to like some guys in that group. Like we, you know, we had a certain little clique right. that used to hang out. And Cube was a part of that. Okay. And I just um bonded, made this friendship that just kind of lasted a long time. So when they, they were after the tour, he was a little upset about the the just just the money. Yeah. And I was just being matter of fact. I'm like, I'm. He's. he's he, I remember him talking to Ren, and he was trying to convince Ren that they should do their own thing. Right. And Ren was like, I'm staying with E. And I was just telling Cube, I was like, man, you in a group. I'm like, when I get my check, it's just, it's just me. Yeah. You and get 100 percent of that. I didn't say quit the group. I didn't say anything. I just, I was just telling him. I was like, look outside. You know, I just, I just got off tour and bought a Mercedes. Mm-hmm. And he, he was mad because E and them got off tour and they was buying stuff. And he's like, man, I wrote the songs. I did this thing. And they weren't, you know, you saw it in the movie, yeah. right? It was something like that. Uh-huh. But long story short, uh, he went solo. He went and did the album with uh, Chuck D and the, the Bomb Squad. Mm-hmm. And we went right back out on tour the next year. It was uh, that America's Most Wanted. Yep. And I think at the time I had Short Dogs in the House. And we've been homies ever since. So, you Man, know. That, is, that is dope. That you, t- you just dropped a little seed in his ear and he took a ran with it. You know what I mean? Changed I'm, his life. But we know Cube now. Yeah. I'm sure that I was just part of just, you know, I didn't convince him. I'm pretty sure he was already planning <laughs> on it. Already going to make that move? Because, I mean, just th- think about it, though. I- even the way they portrayed him in the movie, um, he was that guy. He kept saying, Jerry, where's my money, man? Yeah. Yeah. He's that guy. So that's the cube we know right now. He's probably somewhere right now looking at somebody saying, where's my money, man? He put in the work. He want that check. So, you know what you I'm know. saying? But you think about how you wanted a few artists that had that relationship with Cube. Mm-hmm. You chopped it up with Pac. Mm-hmm. You done some stuff with Biggie. Mm-hmm. Like, what does that say about your resume? About you as a person that you doubt? Do you ever sit back? Have you had a chance to even look back at what you've accomplished and everything, or you just keep moving? Yeah, I think you just got to keep going, man. You, you, I've, along the way, I just do like that. You just reach over and pat yourself yeah. on the back. You don't really need people to to tell you. You don't really need to uh, 
just just do it, man. You can't when you're making history. You don't know you're doing it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You don't know. I'm not. I'm not in the studio saying, "Ooh, this is record is gonna be timeless." You don't know. You just feel it. Yeah. So, yeah. I um I don't really look back and you know sit on the porch in my rocking chair telling old stories. I don't really do that not yet. Mm-hmm. But you know that, that's an option. Okay. So uh, right. sit on the porch in a rocking chair. I mean, we used to be on tour with all the girls. No, that's not, not yet. Not yet. Oh, and, and I think we're far from that. Cause like you said, you still going to be rapping. You got more music to put out. You know what I mean? Exactly. What about the Little John situation? Well, How did look, that come about when you helped him with him, with that situation? Well, I always had a, a ear for just raw, good music. Yep. And I used to like always try to meet people like Aunt Banks, people who I felt like if I was in the studio with you, I don't have to tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. I can actually feed off your energy. I can bring my stuff to the table. And it's, you know, it's not like I'm carrying everybody. So I always like to be in the studio with people I can trust. And Little John, I used to watch him DJ. Okay. And I knew he worked at So So Deaf. I knew he produced, uh, you know, like Shorty Swing My Way and beats like that. The, mm-hmm. um, there was, they, back then they called it Booty Shake Music. Mm-hmm. And... I knew who he was. I don't. I know he knew who I was, but we weren't friends. So I used to be at parties, and I would watch him DJ. And every time he would DJ, it would be like a concert because he has this style where, as he's DJing, he's talking to the crowd, yeah. and as he's DJing, he's particip- The crowd is getting this participation participation thing, mm-hmm. and he's bringing it up. Him, not just the records. So I, I was a fan of Lil Jon. I used to watch him DJ. Okay. And one day he he had put out this record. Um. Who you with? Who you with? Get crunk. Who you with? Uh, which was later remade to be um. What was that a uh, ice cream paint job? Who was um, that um? Uh, Duro. So he yeah. he remade Little John B. But way back then, I Little John had all these chants on that record. To the flow, get low. To the flow. Nobody spitting verses. So I went to him one day, and I was like, man, you need to let me put a do a, a rap version of that song. Mm-hmm. And then he said, he was like, no, nah, let's work, but let's do something new. So that's how it started. Okay. He came by the studio one day. I wasn't there. And he left this um, this song called Couldn't Be a Better Player. That mm-hmm. wasn't the title when he left it. He left a song with a hook. And he just left it. So I just went in there, heard what he did, and I just put three verses on it and gave it to him. And the next thing I know, he's like, he came to get me, and he took me to this club called the 559. Mm-hmm. Club about a little bit bigger than this room right here. Pack like sardines. It was like <laughs> it was like ghetto glamour, glamorous. You like you had to be like VIP hood to get in that joint. Mm-hmm. So he takes me to the five five nine, and I knew what he was gonna do. He was gonna let me see them how they react to the record. To the record. Yep. So the record comes on. Had this long ass intro with the bass drum, and it just takes forever. And they played the whole intro, the whole everything. And I'm like, I get it. Crowd's getting all in the frenzy a little bit, and I thought I knew what was going on. Mm-hmm. So the song is playing. And then he goes, um, he said, now watch this. And the Little John song back then used to have this change. It was like the fight part, like the violent part, the, that sort of 3-6 Mafia thing. Mm-hmm. And it gets to that part. And these these folks in the club just started, I mean, it just went crazy. It lost it. Crazy. Like crazy, crazy, crazy. And that's what that at that moment is when I got it. I, I was like, this dude is the truth. Okay. But not only could he make these songs, he was the one who was going out and making other people like the songs. Mm-hmm. Like he had a DJ, a network of DJ friends. Like he, I don't know what he had his his Rolodex says so so deaf. I don't know what it was. Right. But if Little John had a record that he believed in, he could single handedly make that record hot in other markets. He knew how to make without it pop. the label, without anybody. I don't know what he. I don't know what his technique was. It was just his DJ friends. I have no idea. But Little John can make a record go. And I was like, I gotta stay close to this dude. Right. So, so in a sense, the story goes, I helped Little John out. But mm-hmm. the truth is. I just actually kind of like grabbed somebody that was super talented and yeah. I locked on to him. And wow. people used to tell me, um, yeah, man, you should, you should do this and do that and sign him. And then I'm like, nah, bro, I'm not signing him. I'm, I'm riding with him. Mm-hmm. Like literally, I knew, I knew what Lil John was. I knew. That's dope, man. That, it was a win-win for both sides, obviously, you know what I mean? And you know, many years later, I probably linked up with Lil John in 1996, 97. And like 10 years later, he's giving me songs like, uh, shake that monkey and blow the whistle, and I could, I can't even measure what that did for my career. Man, just those two songs alone. Alone, yeah, you're right. I, mean, I have been impact. paid so many times just to show up at a club and sing two songs. And what you want to hear? 
shake that monkey and blow the whistle. Wow. I'm like, I throw getting it in there too, just for a bonus. Yeah. And going there, I, 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 and we also have a kind of relationship where little John got up to the point where you call him, he's like, I need seventy five thousand for a beat, hundred thousand, like he was hitting him, mm-hmm. and he never charged me for a beat, or he never like put a high price on it, so. It's my guy, man. Yeah, that's a friendship right there, mm-hmm. man. Stories that need to be told, man, need to be heard. Too short, hanging out with the K-Day Morning Show. Album number 20, dropping mm-hmm. in a few days, and it's called what? The Pimp Tape? The Pimp Tape. Definitely and I also, uh, I put out a, um, a playlist called The Sex Tape. Okay. Late last year, I put out a mixtape called The Mixtape. Hella disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> and after The Pimp Tape drops, yeah. what we got, like 60 days after? Two months later, another album's coming out. Okay, so you, you serious gotta, about it? You gotta buy the box set. It's gotcha. called the last tape. Okay. Not gonna really be the last tape, but that's just the name but of still, it. Still, no. I, I love the marketing situation. Make him go Say out it. and get it. Oh, he said, like, "Tell you who's on who's on the album. <laughs> who's on the album? Do you really need to know? Uh, yeah. I need to know. <laughs> that's I one of your biggest know. fans, by the way, Pauline is. Who's on the album? Um, Ti's on the album. E Forty's on the album. Two Chains is on the albums, and Snoop Dogg. Um. Uh, who else is on the album? Give me a name. Schoolboy Q is on no, the album. No. Um, what's my man? What well, you know? Ty Ty Dollar and Jeremiah and French Montana. We're, they're all on the same song. Okay. And uh, Jordan Lucas is on the album too. And it, these are just phone calls you have to make. You don't have to go through the whole politics of the label and all that, right? These are relationships. That's what well, it sounds. Artists like. nowadays know that the collaborations are. The, the songs that the fans gravitate to yep. is, is easier. So, and also when you collaborate with other artists, it makes you better because you definitely don't want to get outshined or embarrassed on your own song. So it makes you work harder. So I, I, I didn't want to overdo it with collaborations. Yeah. But I think we got a good, good vibe. Well, I know you do, man. You're going to continue to bring great music. Too short hanging out with the K-Day Morning Show with Romeo. Um, we play this game called Assed Out because every now and then for your shows, <laughs> you bring them. Mm-hmm. We're going to ask that. You bring them. So if you had to pick a celebrity squad of females to come on stage while you do a couple of your records, mm. who would you pick between these ladies? You ready to play this game? One get to come on stage, the other one's asked out. Mm-hmm. Beyonce or J-Lo? Uh, Who's coming on stage with Too Short? Who has to sit in the audience and watch? Damn. Yeah. That's a tough one. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make it easy for you. Or is it now, or is it like prime time? Uh, like, cause, <laughs> cause young J-Lo is a tough run. Okay, all right. Well, let's go. Well, prime time would have been J-Lo, but now. I still I still got to go with Beyonce. I was trying to find a way to go with young J-Lo with the butt and, the, yeah. you know, the fly girl back in the day. Yeah. But I got to go with H-Town, man. I got to go with Beyonce because okay. she, she shows so much love. That, that Houston right there. Cardi B or Nicki Minaj? Who can get on stage and shake it with you? Mm. Mm-hmm. Nicki Minaj, huh? Yep. Mm. Damn. Cardi already know what she's doing. We know that. However, to see Nikki do it might be different. And they doing what? They they you know how I, you have your girls come out there and I do that? I've never seen thing? Cardi dance. I haven't seen her dance. But I know she got that Latina, so she probably got a wiggle. I don't know. Okay. Um that's a tough one, man. You, are all of them tough like this? Yeah, you, pretty much. You only got two more though. You naming all these, uh, you naming all these menage a trois that should happen. Right? <laughs> exactly. Like you gotta go, you stay. No, everybody, come on. Everybody, in. <laughs> come on. Come to two short world. Uh, damn. That's a tough one, man. Because Nikki had these moments where you know she got so many videos, right? She got these moments where you like would do her, right? But then she got these other moments where you like, I don't know, I don't know. Um. I love the fact that he's putting some deep thought into this too, cause I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking many different reasons, like <laughs> as you should, right? Okay, I feel like uh, both of them would probably have like really New York attitudes, uh-huh. cause I'm a West Coast guy. Okay, so I I'll go on this one. I'm gonna go with the Latina. I'm, okay, I'm gonna go with the Latina. Going with Cardi B on that one. Just I'm thinking New York with okay. my my past history, the Bronx. You know, Harlem, Washington Heights, I'm thinking, you know. Okay. All right, we're going to roll and, with that. And Nikki's from Queens, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with, uh, uptown up that way. Okay, what about Sierra or Tiana Taylor? Mm. Well, after seeing that dance Tiana be doing, I mean, goddamn. <laughs> That's a, that dance is, I had to watch that a couple of times. I'm like, is she really doing this? True. 
That dance is amazing. Mm-hmm. But you know, Sierra can bring it too, though. Like, I always get this little sister kind of vibe with Sierra, like like family. I've always got that. Then the fact that she dated Bow Wow. I, mean, I can't I even picture like, her and Bow Wow no, doing it. No, I can't. I was like... <laughs> And they get a little Maybe. step ladder. I'm like, if you're dealing with that, then you can't mess with me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, Bow Wow's a player, though. That's a homie. No, so, hey, trust saying. me. Trust me. Bow Wow, we used to hook him up all the time when he came through L.A. But to get us here, he needed like a little booster chair. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've dated tall women, and they're they they not tall when they're laying down. All the same size. Exactly. <laughs> Chop them at the ankles. Um... <laughs> I'm gonna go with the dance. I'm gonna go with the dance. I'm gonna go. Well, oh wait, wait a minute. I forgot about Sierra on that last ride when she was on top of that car. I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's Sierra. Again, mm. it would not be easy. Mm. I had to call. Let me call Future. <laughs> <laughs> he he probably t- dabbled in a little both of them. I'm, I'm gonna go with the dance though. The dance is amazing. But then again, Sierra got a Tiana is a mean mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. I mean, yeah. but you ain't got to deal with the attitude. You know what I'm saying? It's just. I'm going to go with the dance. You going, you going with Tiana Taylor? You said, who, who am I pulling on stage? Yeah. You got one more? So it's one more. So right now you're pulling Beyonce, Cardi B, Tiana Taylor. Now, Maya or Shanti? This is easy for me, but who would you pick? I'm going with the Ooh Babies. <laughs> who knows? You know who Ooh Baby is, right? Who's the Ooh Babies? It's Shanti. You going with that one? You, I don't. I don't. Maya, I remember her. Maya. She got skill when it comes to dancing. She was just up here not too long ago. She still looks That's like... That's why I'm not, I'm not even picturing dancing. Okay, well, got you. My bad, see. <laughs> I'm trying to make it ready. Are you like, man, the hell with that? <laughs> uh, Yeah, I'm... I'm, I'm see, Ashanti thick, though. I've seen the recent pictures. You see the one she had for Halloween and little two-piece, whatever? The one with the ooh, baby. Yeah, okay. Because just the way she's, she's going to call you baby all night. Yeah, baby, baby, baby. I mean, that all one record hit like 130 times. Well, hey, we got to give a round of applause because Too Short has uh, passed our round of Assed Out. Album is dropping. Make sure you pick it up. And it is called, once again, The Pimp Tape. The Pimp Tape. And there's a whole box package they can get soon, right? Yeah, all that stuff. Uh, you know, look out for the... Um, I would have brought one. I should have brought you guys a bitch button. Yeah. Bitch? Like, the bitch button. Please send that up here. I'm going to send you some bitch buttons. Because that would come in handy. Trust me. All good. <laughs> Puff Puff Pass Tour going down Microsoft Theater uh, December 15th. You mm-hmm. want your check before or after you get on stage? When you want your check, man. Oh, you guys uh, have a, you guys are trustworthy. Okay. You could, we, you're the kind of pr- promoters that you could pay me next week. It's always You know money. it's good. The money's always good, so don't, don't trip on that. Okay, that's what's up, man. Thank you so much for stopping by the show. You're welcome anytime. Too Pleasure. short to build a man's K-Day. 